ether channel. Why on earth do we need it? So right now we have a simple little environment. We have two switches and they're connected with four links between them. And we have two users. We have Twilight and Fluttershy. And they're communicating just fine between each other. Everything's going fine. But the problem is, between these two switches, spanning tree protocol is running. So what it does is finds one path to the root bridge. Let's say, for example, Flutter is the root bridge. The root bridge. So what it does, Twilight says, I need to find one path to that root bridge. So for example, let's say it disables these three links. And there, now there's only one link between these two switches right here, this top one, let's say, for example. So the problem is, what if we have a whole bunch of computers? Here's one over here. We have one over here. Another one over here. We got another one over here. One over here. Another one over here. So the problem is, right now, they're sharing if these computers PCs that are in green are, I guess, communicating with each other across these two switches, they have to share this one link right here on the very top because the other three were disabled. Because, again, with spanning tree protocol, it dis finds one path to the root bridge to prevent layer two loops. So if you find one path, you can't loop around back to yourself. And I cover that in another video with uh, layer two loops. So in order to resolve this problem and to utilize all the links between the two switches, we use Ether Channel. So with Ether Channel, what we do is we put a command on all these interfaces, and what it does is aggregates these together as one virtual link, one virtual port. And you'll see that later on when we create when we do the configuration. So now the switches see these as uh, as one link between each other. That's what it treats it as. And when there are tons of computers communicating across these switches, it load balances those frames across all the links. So you can utilize all the bandwidth, which is amazing. So how do we set this up? So it's pretty easy. If we look at the command line, we go to global configuration mode, and I'm using the range command. It makes it a lot easier. So I can set this um, channel group command on multiple interfaces all at once. Um, I picked one through four. It doesn't have to be in order as long as the ports match up. One to one, one to two across the switches. Or they could be one to 24, three to seven. I don't know why you do that. It would be pretty confusing. But um, they just have to match up across the switches, right? channel group, whatever. Um, and once we go into that, when we go to the interface, we say channel group that sets up the um, ether channel, and you give it a number, identify it locally in the switch. Doesn't have to be the same as as the other side. Um, it's just to identify it and the mode. So there are a few different modes you can set ether channel. Uh, you can use dynamic protocols if you want. Um, there's LACP and PAGP. One's um, kind of an open standard. The other's a Cisco proprietary one. But um, all you need to do is turn it on. You don't need to negotiate the other side if you want to do Ether Channel. Um, you, you can if you want. There may be situations you want to do that. But for right now, we're just going to turn it off. Just say it's on. And once you do that, it will create a virtual, uh, I guess, port. And we go to it by using the command interface port channel 2 2 because we use channel group 2 makes sense and normally what you want to do is set it to a trunk port so um, normally in most switching infrastructures you have multiple VLANs so now between these two switches um, there is a trunk and multiple VLANs can traverse across these, this, uh, these switches so you do the same thing to the other side I used one just to show that it can be different. It doesn't have to be the same. Um, and that's about it. So let's go ahead and set it up. So let's go to Twilight first. And 
interface range. Interface range of zero slash one through four. And channel group to mode on. And then we go to the interface port channel two switch port mode trunk um, whenever you do settings you want to do it to the port channel now don't go to the interfaces directly because you could mess up things and it may like brick your port channel I mean your ether channel so we do it the same thing to the other side twilight actually we did it to twilight so let's go to fluttershy let's go to her switch do the same thing They don't have to be the same ports across. They just have to be, I guess, link up one to one on each of the switch. I just used one through four again. It's just the easiest. One mode on. And go to the interface port channel one and put it in trunk mode. So that is about it. So if we go ahead and we'll open up the PCs. So let's see if we can ping the other side. So we'll ping. So let's wait. Should come up. May take a while. Um, there we go. So now Ether Channel is up and running. And you can see now all the links are green now. Before normally, a few of them were amber, and there was only one green one on uh, one of these switches. So now we're communicating. Works great. So if we go back to the diagram, really simple. These are now one virtual port, and Spanning Tree does not disable this any of these ports because it's just one it's only one path to the root bridge whatever whichever switch that may be for example that could be the root bridge um, and it this is only one path there aren't multiple ports it sees it now as one uh, one port and again the reason why we do that if we have a bunch of PCs now it can share all that bandwidth so it's load balance across each of these ports so effectively if these are 100 megabits per second ports we've got 400 megabit per seconds um, and it can be load balanced across all the links so now they don't have to share one port and that's about it so I hope this was helpful and thank you for watching